David versus Goliath, tonight on the Watchlist series. Trialsight News is, above all, dedicated to transparency and access to clinical trials with an emphasis on clinical research sites and investigators, those who are on the front lines of clinical research. We bring to light the events and highlights of the clinical research from translational research to clinical trials that we believe patients and health professionals should know about. From life-saving therapies to unacceptable behaviors centering on greed and corruption, we cover it all. Now, one such case of highly questionable practices came to our attention in the case of errant gene therapeutics. We first covered them in our article, which has thousands of views, titled, A Family Man's Battle Against the Forefront of Capitalist Medicine, The Case of Errant Gene Therapeutics. We kept our audiences informed thereafter with the follow-up on errant gene therapeutics, their major victory in New York court, and summaries of errant gene therapeutics versus Sloan Kettering court exhibits. And then finally, their justice-driven road to prosecution, Aaron Gene Therapeutics versus Third Rock Ventures. On top of all of this, I managed to sit down with Patrick Girondi and talk to him about this back in September. Well, on our watch list episode today, I had another opportunity to sit down with Mr. Girondi and talk to him about how this story has progressed since we last covered it. And here is how it went. We here at Trialsight News, we want to welcome back Patrick Girondi. We spoke with him back in September about his David versus Goliath struggle with his company Errant Gene Therapeutics and its legal case versus Third Rock Ventures, Sloan Kettering, Bluebird Bio, and CEO Nick Leshley personally. So, Mr. Girondi, welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, it's our pleasure, and we're so happy to have you back. So let's jump right into this. A lot has happened, and we know the case is proceeding this summer. What have you learned about yourself in this epic struggle? Well, I think the first thing that I learned is, that, and the most important thing, is how really limited I, I am. My greatest strength ends up being the love that I have for my son. And over time, I've met so many men, women, children with orphan diseases. I've traveled Tanzania, India, etc. And I've learned that they're basically all my sons, brothers, and sisters. And so the real strength that I have has come from meeting these people, whether they're on the south side of Chicago or the west side of Mumbai. And um, it's really given me some incredible insight into their lives. And it's made me, I think, a, a much better person. Well, I got to tell you, from my last conversation with you, I'm not surprised. So the, the family man struggle then has taught us at Trial Site News a lot. We wonder if the type of line crossing, sharp dealing that you have experienced, where it goes even beyond gloves off, bare knuckle tactics to potential civil torts and perhaps even closing in on criminal conduct. Does that represent an isolated incident or broader practice? I look at this like I look at everything in my life. You know, um, when I was a kid, my mother said that when we needed money, I would go door to door trying to sell the utensils. When I was eight or nine, I began shining shoes. When I was 12, I bust tables. When I was 15, I washed dishes in a Northwestern hospital kitchen. I was 17, I was in the military. When I got out of the military, I drove trucks. Um, I, I've seen a lot of different sides of life and I've always tried to put myself in other people's uh, shoes. Take a, take a walk in there their shoes, you know, see how their life is. Look at their trials and tribulations. I, you know, each night I go to bed and I, I, before I put my head on the pillow, I ask myself, you know, what didn't I do today? I should have, what could I have done better and what I need to do tomorrow. In the end, when we talk about uh, the behavior and especially gloves off bare knuckle tactics, which has been used not only by you now, but also in court documentations, I don't think that's what I'm up against. I'm not not up against gloves off, bare knuckle tactics. If we're going to call lying, treachery, and action which endangers and kills patients as gloves off, bare knuckles, then you know why don't we call the murdering and torturing that gang leaders and the actions of terrorists do as gloves off, bare knuckles? Hmm. Um, what I really believe that I've encountered is cowardly behavior, sneaky backdoor dealing that pads 
people's pockets with the blood and suffering of patients and their families. If we look at what's going on today, we look at the Sackler family. You know, they claim there's a net worth of 13 billion, all the pain and suffering that's been created by their industry. And it looks like maybe we'll take 3 billion and we're going to let them off. You know, following the American dream today seems to be trying to get filthy rich. And it seems that we're willing to give people that are trying to follow the American dream of getting filthy rich when they get caught breaking laws, it almost seems like we're willing to give them a slap on the wrist. I mean, I have two personal family friends who lost sons to these antidepressants. One kid, 21 years old, or young man, 20, 21 years old, walked on the railroad tracks in Beverly until the commuter train caught up with him. Another kid plunged a knife into his chest while his little brother tried to stop him. Oh, wow. um, I believe the American dream is about happiness and about helping others. But instead, you know, as Michael Douglas, Gordon Gecko, and you know, Wall Street film said, greed is good. It seems that it's become the truth for us and that giving the cowards who chase the greed a pass when they get caught seems to be normal. Um, so these gloves off bare knuckle tactics, I think, are, are epidemia in the industry. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the craziness that goes on, the unconscionable things that, for example, Sloan Kettering is indemnifying Bluebird for gross negligence and wrongful doing against EGT. I believe this is against public policy. It's unenforceable. Yet Sloan Kettering and not-for-profits paying millions and millions of dollars in attorney fees for Bluebird and Nick Gleshley instead of treating patients, instead of curing disease. Um, they claim that they had no money to buy new vector, uh, yet they have tens of millions of dollars for Bluebird and Nick Leshley's attorneys. I mean, Sloan Kettering gets hundreds of millions of dollars from the NIH and CI. This is taxpayer money, and they get this hundreds of millions of dollars each year. It ends up being billions and billions of dollars of taxpayer money. And there's got to be strings attached to this money. There's got to be more control. You know, the CEO of Sloan Kettering, he makes six and a half million dollars a year. He hasn't lost his job in all of these scandals, these recent scandals. Wow. It's horrifying that the same institute encourages patients to start fund me pages to confront, you know, ridiculous prices. And, and then they have the absurdities like the CEO get, making $30,000 a day. I mean, it, it, it's just, it just all baffles me. I mean, his chief, chief medical officer is caught not disclosing sponsors. His top licensor gets caught with his you know, hands in the cookie jar and has to give $1.4 million back. Um, he's got board members and employees who are trying to sell um, uh, uh, patient data to set up AI profit companies. Um, you know, the CEO of Sloan Kettering, his name's Thompson. I've met him a couple of times, and he might be a great guy. Um, but he's been there for 10 years and all of this has happened on his watch. Uh, I mean, I don't understand that he's still in his position. I mean, whether he's completely innocent in all of this, uh, and, and is just kind of lackadaisical. I mean, he doesn't belong there. I mean, it's the same thing I say about, um, Nick Leshley, the CEO of Bluebird. I mean, you know, after it's surfaced and been in court documents that he's told analysts to hide information, which is pertinent to every decision that an investor makes in Bluebird Bio, how he's still the CEO, his board doesn't do anything. It tells you that the board's in his pocket. Well, if he goes to jail, then the board should go with him. I mean, but the problem is today, you know, we talk about this kind of behavior. The corporate board members, they all have insurance to cover any legal bills and liability, and they all have get out of jail cards free. I mean, sorry to go on and on about this stuff, but I, I, you know, it just drives me absolutely crazy. And I mean, in, you know, whether Bluebird loses in courts or wins in court, they win. They took a faulty vector. They created clonal dominance in 2010. They blocked their own and sabotaged their only competitor. Nick Lesh, the CEO, has made close to $100 million in compensation since 2013. I mean, if he does 10 years in jail, that's $10 million a year. I mean, I'd do it standing on my head. Um, you know, it, it's just all just, just baffles me. And 
uh, I was a trader at one time at the Mercantile Exchange, Chicago Board of Trade, member of New York Stock Exchange, et cetera. I watch his stock, which has come down from 230 to 70, now back to 90. All the while, the Dow Jones Pharmaceutical Index is up 20%. I can't believe that investors you know, aren't out there. Uh, I myself have capitalistic beliefs, but for the good of capitalism, we got to protect it from pigs like these men are, or in the end, capitalism cannibalizes itself. Right. Crony, crony capitalism has is, is, uh, been a bane in our society for at least all my life. Now, clearly there is something broken. An industry needs trust from its stakeholders and patients and their families are fundamental to that story. So how then can we start building trust back into the world of drug development? People trust the court system, you know, to kind of weed these these uh, bad seeds or bad eggs out. The problem is the court system is overloaded. So these companies spend millions and millions of dollars on expensive mouthpieces to avoid justice. I mean, my case has been going on over five years. Um, we're finally getting to court in July. It'll be five and a half years since we filed. And all the while, my competitor is trying to get his faulty product approved. It's now partially approved in Europe. When they get a big lead in things like that, that means that all of the funding dries up for other companies, whether the other companies are good or bad. Um, you know, uh, we're now waiting for um, the publishing of our three patients in, um, from uh, Sicily, who are all beta zero, beta zeros. Um, and after five, after I'm sorry, seven and five years, two out of three of these patients have a reduction in over 50% of their blood transfusions, which is incredible. They did myelo suppression, not myeloablation. Um, they used an, a vector made in 2009-10, not a modern made vector. There was very there was no tighter enhancements used that they use today, etc. You know, you say, how do you get your faith back? I mean, yeah, that's a great question because you know, um, our patients in the end were all uh, p given the back seat. Um, so that Bluebird could get a clean runway, jack up the price of a drug by over a million dollars. And, uh, you know, uh, in the end, if we want to mix it all in, it gets complex, et cetera. But Celgene buys Juno. Um, and the inventor of my product, him and his wife, are also the scientific founders of Juno. I know it, it sounds a bit complicated, and I certainly don't want to confuse anyone, but all of these things are become intertwined, and not just with my case, but with all of these cases. So on that note then, I mean, part of the dynamic is access to drugs and pricing. And even if payers grant access, often the drugs are just too expensive. So what direction on that front, do we need to take to consider how pricing can become reasonable for all? Otherwise, there are so many people that won't get helped by advancements in new therapies. Well, you know, there's some really outstanding leaders that we need to lean on in our industry. I know some of them, Emil Kakis of Ultragenics, John Ballantyne, Michael Chambers, El Deverans, J. Scott Elmer of St. Jude. Andrew Wilbur, Norboy, Jeff Marazzo, Spark, Marlene Hafner, Sandy Hayhurst, Jennifer, Jennifer Van Hooten, Ken Sussman. I, I mean, they're all wonderful people in this industry. And um, in a certain sense, we need to follow them. Um, and these kind of people believe they did a good job, not because the price of their shares are higher necessarily, but because they're helping save patients' lives. And eventually, of course, the share price will follow that. Um, you know, most therapies are invented in academia, places right. like Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, the universities, Boston University, Mass, MIT, IIT, et cetera. And unfortunately, Big Pharma either takes advantage of incompetent officers or actually inserts friends like the CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering, who are actually in the end, you know, just other pharmaceutical um, officers, other executives of pharma 
even though they're at the head of our non-for-profits. They're at the head of our academic um, institutes. Mm -hmm. And somehow uh, therapies that are paid for by the public taxpayer are given away to these for-profit companies. Um, and then to make it worse, they take this technology and then they charge the patient uh, through the nose, ridiculous, sometimes millions of dollars. Um, I believe that the NIH and the NCI and these academic institutions have to have more control and the government needs to have more control about over all of these tax taxpayer investments. Um, these white collar criminals are the first people to call the police when they feel threatened. And they're the same ones to say that, well, oh, we need to privatize all health industry because the government is corrupt, inept, or incompetent. You know, it, it, they're a bunch of opportunists. We really can't have things, you know, both ways. So let's then move towards the future. Assuming you come out ahead from this court battle, what are some of your thoughts as to how you can take what you've learned and help patients and the industry come to a better place? Well, I'm in constant contact with people like Lucha Luzzato, Eugene McCarthy. Um, the Orphan Drug Act needs to be revisited and the diseases need to be regrouped into micro orphans to big orphans. You can't give a company the same carte blanche when you have a patient population of 10 as you do when you have a patient population of 1,000 or 10,000. There needs to be safety valves in the Orphan Drug Act that would allow the FDA to limit market exclusivity in case of sponsors' excessive profit from an orphan drug. And drug prices need to be justified. Lucha Luzzato published in July 2018 in Lancet, and he, he called it outrageous prices of orphan drugs, a call for collaboration. We need to involve people like him in trying to come up with solutions. Professor Eugene McCarthy, who a call to prosecute drug companies, fraud is organized crime and use RICO. And he wrote this wonderful article and brought all of these great examples about how today the drug industry is actually um, uh, gives uh, represents in a certain sense or is very similar to the old organizations, whether you want to call it organized crime or mafia, etc. And we've got to stop co ridiculous compensation of CEOs and their boards who rubber stamp their actions and the thousands of overpaid minions of the CEOs. We have to stop all of that money going being put as drug development. That doesn't belong in drug development. The 24 million that Nick Leshley comp was compensated yes, last year somehow is put into drug development and then they whine and cry about how much drug development costs. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's just, it, just incredible. Now, before I let you go, Patrick, um, can you tell us about International Museum of Surgical Science? Yes. Um, as we were talking about before, there are some wonderful, wonderful people in the industry. Yes. And um, the International Museum of Surgical Science in Chicago exemplifies uh, these people. And from February 21st to April 5th, there will be a show, an exhibition. Um, the artist's name is Megan Euchre, E-U-K-E-R. Um, I met Megan Euchre about three and a half years ago. Uh, I told her the story about the family who had gifted me a Versace jacket to perform for their two children who had died, Lane and Noah. Uh, she was very touched by that. She actually made a statue of me uh, in the jacket. She came to uh, a couple of the concerts. Um, she awarded uh, another statue, the same statue of, uh, in the jacket. Uh, to Franco Locatelli, to John Tisdale, and to Michelle Settlin, who are all recipients of the Orphan uh, Disease or Orphan Drug Award. Um, and she's putting on an exhibition between February 21st and April 5th at the International Museum of Surgical Science uh, talking about this case, about this court case. Um, and I think it 
takes a lot of courage on the part of the museum, a lot of, you know, uh, real hard decision making. And I admire Megan Euchre for her dedication to the orphan diseases as well. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely link to it so our audience can learn more about it and maybe even those in the area can attend. So thank you so much for talking with us today, Patrick. It was great to have you back. And as always, it's, it's an enlightening experience talking to you. And we'll certainly be keeping our readers and listeners and viewers up to date on how this story progresses. And uh, for those of you in the audience who want to learn more, you can go to errantgene.com. And of course, we will be keeping this story posted on Trailside News. And links will be provided in the description below. So thank you again, Patrick, for joining us. Thank you. The pleasure is ours. And that wraps up my interview with Mr. Girondi. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Watchlist series. We'll see you next time.